How the hell are you, man? Great to see you. Great to see you. Good. I'm good. good to, I'm good. Good to see you in your little dojo. Dinner with my fam. Yeah. Dojo life. <clears throat> right on. Well. How are you? Tell me about tell me about the uh, big dump you all got in Jackson, like we did here. How's the snow? Uh, it's so deep. Yeah, it, it's um, it's just not been any one day. You know, it's just been snowing every day. Um, oh my gosh! <laughs> so it's it's like dream conditions for skiers right now, for sure. But we've also had some really sad, um, sad news with some fatalities um, in our area not actually directly in the Tetons but yesterday our community lost a very well-loved snowboarder um, in a very sad accident and that's kind of the the yin and yang of uh, of the world of backcountry skiing yeah man that same same thing in Utah there was four four guys that got buried maybe it was last week recently too so some some of the guys that were associated with uh the local uh gear room here so really sad no doubt really sad yeah i was following that also yeah so so those of so those of you that don't uh know z like so um, thank you for coming on first of all i've been kind of trying to highlight coaches that i have a lot of respect for and that you know have have different perspectives and have good things to say so I really wanted to highlight you and have you talk about mountain athletes because I don't do a lot of talking about, you know, aerobically conditioned mountain athletes and how we can actually target those athletes with training. And I know there's a lot of those people that follow me. And so go ahead and introduce yourself. For those of you that didn't see the video, go ahead and introduce yourself and kind of your background where you're, where you're coming at from a coach. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, my name's Z. I live in Jackson, Wyoming. Um, I'm, a, I'm a dad, two kids. Um, and my life has really revolved around the mountains. Um, I grew up in the Alps and fell in love with alpine climbing and big mountain skiing um, as, as a child, really, and um, have pursued that all my life. And now I split my time between working as a mountain guide. Um, so I guide backcountry skiing and and climbing of, of different sorts um and i've always had this passion for human performance and for the study of the human body and so i also work as a coach um and um yeah i'm a big fan of, i'm a big fan of dialers i'm a big fan of uh of your approach to work and um yeah keen to to share with you so so really i'm um and I know, and I met Z um, years ago at the at one of our conferences that I taught with Steve originally. I think it was the first one, right, in Lander. Yeah, it was. That you came to. And so we've been relatively close ever since then and passing through and being able to exchange kind of some information about training and whatnot. So, like, you're, you originally were interested in the idea of coaching as a guy. So what got you interested in coaching and how – Specifically, I know you have some athletes that work with you. How does your framework work for, you know, managing individual athletes? I'm assuming your business is able to take on multiple types of athletes. Tell me more about that. Sure. So, you know, the, the large bulk of our work is with our athlete team. And that's a collection of 43 athletes from around the world um, that we connect with all throughout the week um on zoom so we develop training plans for them and then we connect um in like live q a sessions that we have that they're invited to we have a weekly um live dojo session so that's where we actually have 45 minutes together to train so you show up camera on um and we will tell you what tools you need and then we dive into a 45 minute session and that's super sweet right we can live with people and help um, make these little adjustments that can make a big difference. And then we have um, this other session called the Power Half Hour, which is a half hour weekly deep dive into some aspect of the science of why we train this way. So we might be studying the science of aerobic capacity one week, or what's the role of fascia in the human system, or you know how do we improve our maximum strength? What's the difference between strength and power? Any of these types of topics that are of interest we'll dive into in the power half hour um 
And yeah, so we have a collection of athletes from really a pretty broad array of sports, but certainly we have a huge, the vast majority of are connected to the mountains in some way, you know, because of my background. But now we have a, a guy who plays for the Boston Red Sox, who's one of the most explosive athletes I've ever met or come across in my life. He's amazing. Um, we have a Olympic marathon runner who just ran a two hour, 11 minute marathon, blitz, blitzing fast guy, playing alpinist, we have free ride skiers, just like a kind of a mix. And um, yeah, we tried, a big part of what we're trying to do too is build community, right? And you know, um, you, sure. you do that through your courses and, and giving people a chance to connect with you directly. And, and this is kind of one of the ways that we try to do it. Yeah, yeah, I like, I really like the idea of having the one hour live courses and I want to talk a lot about kind of your methodology and I want you to introduce and talk about the body weight program and I'm assuming that a lot of those 45 minute live activities are based on that right it's mostly body weight focused stuff in case people don't have like equipment to do it at the same time is that right well we do really want we we really are big into people training at home we think that if you can train at home, you're stripping away so many of the barriers that make training something that's not possible because you're a parent and you've got all these obligations and time is short and you don't want to worry about masks maybe and driving, all these things. So we feel that one of the ways that we can help athletes be successful is help them turn their own home, really small spaces even, into effective workout space. So we have no bias at all body weight or a kettlebell or a synapse or a pull-up bar like we're ultimately interested in creating the right environment for the body we think you can do that in a lot of different ways body weight programs are awesome because of that simplicity you mentioned but all of our athletes have some equipment also okay okay cool cool yeah so that and then and that's what i want you to 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 talk about ultimately but we're gonna wait off on that i want you because i'm assuming that a lot of these uh, participants today will be rock climbers. So I want you to help define, since you are one yourself and you know enough athletes that are really at that elite level status for alpine climbing, like what do climbers really need to attain that type of status? Like what's the direction do they need to focus on? Because when I was in college, I used to love to boulder. I like to trad climb. I like to alpine climb but I wouldn't have considered myself an elite alpine climber because of, I think those other two disciplines, maybe perspective on that. Yeah. I think, um, you know, when we talk about like climbing a big mountain, climbing in a, in a big mountain environment, there's three things that an athlete needs. Um, they need aerobic capacity. They need strength and they need athleticism. And those are like, if, like our three buckets for how we're training athletes. Um, obviously, if we're climbing at a crag or if we're exclusively bouldering, sport climbing, then we can weight that towards certain adaptations, right? We're gonna focus more on um, strength and perhaps strength endurance, power endurance, and that end of the spectrum. But if you want to climb in big alpine terrain, then you have to be able to last for days on end and roots can go on for days. So, you know, we have a couple of uh, guys like um, one of our athletes, Michael Gardner. Um, he's a young under the radar crusher who just um, a couple of years ago completed the second ascent of Light Traveler, uh, a 9,000 foot route on the south face of Denali. They did it in a single push. I can't remember how many hours, but, you know, you're going into like the three day range um, with difficult climbing early on in the route. Um, it's a Marco Pretzel route, like never been repeated. Uh, and then those guys did it in a single push. Uh, Infinite Spur, he was right, um, with the American Alpine Club. And that had been a route that was established by legendary alpinist Michael Kennedy. I believe they established it in somewhere between 11 and 14 days um a massive massive route and uh, michael and his partner sam hennessy completed the route in 48 hours and they did it in ski boots carrying their skis and then skied off the summit wow. you know, so like yeah. obviously i mean yeah just really inspiring
um, um, and, and other guys, other like uh, Michael Arnold, who um, came back from a huge expedition in the Himalaya, trying to ski an unskied peak at over 7,000 meters. So obviously, like for, for athletes that are uh, hungry for that big alpine terrain, um, aerobic capacity is king. And right. if you take that one adaptation away, there's, you can't even access the terrain. Um, so right. that, the way that we're skewing um, training, obviously, is going to depend on the size of the terrain and the style. You know? But then on the other hand, we've got a guy who plays for the Boston Red Sox. Like, his longest effort is, you know, uh, would be measured in seconds. Right? So he's got to be really explosive, really reactive. Um, so we're, we're trying to, to bias those things, but yeah, ultimately three buckets in our view, aerobic capacity, endurance, well, strength, and then athleticism. Right. Right. Okay. And so the athleticism is part probably where you tie in the body weight program, because what I see with that is the value in getting tired, but still being able to be dynamic and still having a, a high or relatively high amount of velocity, like very quickly. So that dynamic endurance almost is what we could call it, where in the mountains, when you're getting tired, you have to have that for days, like you're describing, you know, as soon as you get a falter of that, then you're going to get injured, right? You're going to fall to your death kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the body, you're right. Like the, the body weight program was an effort of ours to introduce um, a method of training that's in line with our philosophy of how we want to train strength, which is very biased towards like improving maximum strength as a baseline, right? And we think that like, if you can move the needle on an athlete's maximum strength, then you've created capacity that they can then express in terms of speed strength or power um, or, you know, endurance strength. Um, all of those other um, aspects of strength rely on that maximum strength. So for us, the body weight program was a way for us to explore the idea of, hey, can we use leverage that is inherent in the body by using your legs and your arms and your torso to create leverage that can um, create m very high levels of mechanical tension in the muscle in a very short period of time as opposed to doing a body weight program where you have those lower threshold motor units by doing lots and lots of repetitions. And we really try to stay away from that kind of training, except for in very specific periods um, when an athlete is maybe approaching their send go or, you know, sending window. But apart from that, we, we tend to favor maximum strength development. And we felt that within the the sphere of body weight programs there really wasn't an option for that so that's cool. kind of our bias with the body weight program king to what you were saying which is also bridging towards athleticism is we do think that if you can use the body's own leverage and create rotational forces then you're you're starting to connect lines of tension rather than isolate a particular muscle and just take that muscle to fatigue. We want to say right. like, hey, can we create longer lines of tension um, that create a more intuitive way of moving your body? Um, right. Which, I mean, that makes perfect sense for someone that's, you know, using axes and going up a steep slope, right? There's that constant leverage that you got to reach and you got to cross talk and you got something attached to your back. And so, like that it makes total sense in terms of being able to apply that tension. So question for you, how are you usually applying those? Like what's your general like framework for like a set rep scheme, let's say of doing that program. Are you taking people in those positions for like doing repeaters as an example, or are you doing isometric hold reps or are you doing isotonic? Like how are you, how do people conceptualize that? Cause I'm visualizing in my head, like, you know, doing like an arms overhead push-up position, which is a really good exercise, arms straight overhead. How would you program that for someone if people wanted to try it at home? Yeah, totally. I think that the body weight program and probably a bit conditioned by the limitations of only having your body weight as a load, we 
I would say that a lot of the a lot of the movements are isometric, and we're programming them in that six to eight second type of hold time. Um, not exclusively, okay. but very often. Um, or it, you know, if we are doing reps, we're trying to use leverage and angles that would cause an athlete to be able to be under very high tension with just two, three, maybe four reps. Okay. Okay. And then are you changing the velocity in those movements too? Like, is that something that you cue that you progress someone into? Or is that just like you kind of, you know, because I, I, in my personal opinion, I think there's a lot of value, certainly in like what I do with finger training for people, there's some really good value in improving that rate coding and, you know, rate of force development, you know, and I'm assuming you're doing some of that as well. Yeah, that's such a good question. Um, I, I don't think that the body weight program does that. Um, okay. I think that the body weight program really focuses on the maximum strength. A couple okay. reasons for that. One, it, I do think it's difficult to, to safely program hundreds of different athletes with very rapid rates of force development, all using one particular weight, which is their body weight. And I totally agree with you. I think that's such an important dimension of training is it's not good enough to be strong. How well can you apply that strength to the speed of your sport, right? So like you could have steel fingers, but if they can't produce force on a hold really quickly, then you're never gonna catch that hold. So totally agree with you. But for me, the body weight program is not really a place to do that because we know that that, that rapid application of load is the best way to injure somebody. And it seems like a better way to do that is in a more individual setting where we can say, hey, wait a minute, what sort of tissue capacity do you have? How well can you control these positions? Okay, yeah, you're looking really good. Now let's start to apply uh, uh, you know, um, an effort that's going to really challenge your rate coding, that's going to require you to uh, recruit very quickly. That's something that's maybe better suited for like an athlete team environment, not like an online program or that's an individual. Opinion. Okay. And then what are the other would be really useful in like the complex kind of training method where we're doing some controlled movement followed by something that's more isotonic range of motion that's like more explosive. Seems like it would fit very well, you know, into doing some sort of, you know, pressing isometric position followed by something that's more full range of motion. I'm assuming, do you, do you, do you, do you visualize it in that context as well for your clients? Yeah, totally. So when we're using body weight movements with our internal athletes, we're starting to integrate that like combination of a really maximum effort and then a very rapid explosive effort combined together. Um, yeah, that, okay. I think science really supports that. That makes a ton of sense. Um, right. Yeah. Well, the other, the other thing that I'm thinking of too that I've been kind of geeking out on now is like, the criticisms behind the, the traditional textbook energy systems, you know, like there's good science now to support that. Like, it's not like this phosphagen system, like anything anaerobic, there's no such thing really as anaerobic or aerobic exercise. And even when we're using, when I'm measuring like muscle oxygen saturation recently, when we have a high intensity effort, you're still like utilizing oxygen. So that adaptive capacity that you're saying aerobically is really valuable for any type of, you know, intensity for engagement. So when you're doing your positions, how much do you focus on like breathing? Like what's your, I'm assuming that you have some sort of good like criteria and or cueing for people utilizing their respiratory system. How would you teach people about that? Yeah. Okay. So I, I love that, right? I'm, I'm so on board with that type of thinking because I think as humans, we like to, we like to organize um, and, and categorize systems. And that makes sense, right? It makes it easier to communicate. But the more we study biology, the more we see that all of these systems just really bleed over into one another. Um, Phil Maffetone, who's been a leader in um, aerobic capacity training, who developed the MAF method, maximum method, which I think provides an excellent baseline for thinking about how we improve aerobic capacity. You know, 
his his thinking and, and he comes from sort of the opposite world that you do right like he's trained athletes who are multi-day events and and this is very much to, towards um the aerobic system and he says like look you take an athlete who's running a mile and a well-conditioned well prepared who's running a mile can do so relying very heavily on a fat burning system uh on oxygen uh, uh an aerobic system so traditionally we would say no that's you know that's a, a three to four minute effort um that's a very glycolytic type of effort so we need to not think about it in terms of aerobic capacity but it's not that simple right these these systems that we use they bleed over each other when we're sitting in a couch and then we stand up that just simple effort of standing up requires all three energy systems um, right. and and they there's there's no clear line so i think what you're saying right. makes a ton of sense is also why we're constantly saying like i have athletes come to me and say like i just want to climb 514 I'm with and it's like no like you are a human being um you are an organic specimen that has three energy systems and all three are going to contribute to everything you do admittedly in different proportions right right well and the the, the those systems the aerobic system is just a great a, such a greater abundance too you know there's it would be foolish to not capitalize on that system you know and if we look at other sports too we know that people are getting stronger and they're getting faster and they're workhorses too so the idea that you can only be really strong and powerful or have endurance is totally out the window because there's way too many exceptions to that rule to prove that that doesn't work totally and and for me it's like i always go back to biology i'm always like i want to use my understanding of biology to guide my training and when we look at the human system and you see that we have these various um fuels that can uh power human movement um you know phosphogen system glycolytic system aerobic system but they all ultimately have to create atp and that's the end product but we have more than one way to get there and i love that that's what's so rad about right. being a human right is that like it's like having a it's like having a garage with three cars you know um we'd be lucky to have one car it would be fun to just have a drag racer but we have like a prius we have an audi a4 and we have like a ferrari all in the same garage right. that's just part of being human and so when we think about training like to me that makes so much sense like given that biology shows us that that's the way we've adapted well those are capacities that we have and we can enhance with training and that's to me that's just like the fun of being a human being is like you have all of those capacities go go enjoy them right. use them right and we're so damn good at adapting to stuff too you know and that's when i think the you know so the crazy. concept of periodized nutrition makes a lot of sense too cuz we can you know fuel for the task and you know if the energy systems are flexible then we have more opportunity and more capacity in general versus if we just focus on only one system, right? That mm. doesn't make sense for alpine athletes. Like they have to be able to kick on the low gear and go hard and they have to be able to stand for a couple days and they have to have the mental toughness to actually, you know, uh, survive. So I think that's there's some so so what I want you to tell me um in terms of like how do you train that? How do you train let's say someone's at home and they want to like work on their respiratory system and they don't have a lot of equipment. They want to do body weight training stuff. They want to buy your book. How do they focus on increasing their respiratory demand? How do you cue people to Um, Tyler, I think your phone's cutting out a bit, but oh shoot, I, let me make sure. Uh, my four children and they're all on the week. internet. <laughs> yeah, I hear that. <laughs> <laughs> they're playing for they're playing Fortnite. Do your do your, your boy like Fortnite? Um, he used to. Yeah, he hasn't oh. been on it as much, but yeah, when he was younger, for sure. Yep. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's that's totally a thing. <laughs> yeah, that's an internet killer. <laughs> it really is. Um, so maybe if you didn't if you didn't hear me, how how would no, someone no, I, if they I, wanted to if they oh you did okay cool yeah, I mean, 
you know, for us, like, we really favor developing the aerobic system outside. Um, and that works for our athletes because the way that the, the patterning of the movement is, is outdoor movement, right? It, it's, it's human powered locomotion, running, um, backcountry skiing, uh, hiking, uh, w whatever, alpine climbing. Th those are patterns of movement in natural terrain. So the vast majority of our aerobic training is biased towards being done outside. Okay. Um, we do have some athletes that have limitations in that regard, but you know, we're, we're, our philosophy of aerobic capacity training is that we really want to help athletes bias their systems towards all day efforts, fat burning efforts. Um, so like our, you know, our sort of like guidance around aerobic training is go long, go slow, don't take breaks and stop eating. Oh, okay. And, so like um, for the whole day? Well, that's not always for the whole feasible, or right? For the whole session, for the whole training session. Yes. Like, I'm not going to say that that's a rule and it's always that way. But, it, you know, so we train in 12-week blocks. And so we take that 12 weeks and we break it into three parts. So we have a first phase, a second phase, and a third phase. Our first phase... So that's weeks one through four. That's where we're really prioritizing aerobic capacity development. And during that phase, whether an athlete has 60 or 70 minutes or whether they have four or five hours, we want to create the right environment for their body to adapt so that when they come out to Jackson to come back on skiing, when they go on their expedition to Alaska, when they tow up to the start line mile race, that their system is primed to burn fat and to rely as heavily as possible on their oxidative system. And the training for that is really going to be steady. It's quite slow um, because what we, what we find a lot happens, you know, and I see this as a, as a Jackson resident, is that, you know, people are, spend most of their time training outdoors going way too hard. And as soon as you start going way too hard, your con the contribution of your glycolytic system is just going to go up, right? Like, that's, what, that's the cue you're giving to your body. You're saying to your body, like, hey, I'm going to go quite hard, so I need this fuel source to be quite immediate. Um, I need you to give it to me quick. Well, your body's smart. It's going to figure out a faster pathway, and that pathway is going to be more glycolytic. What right. we want to do is say... You know, if you look at your life, your life already conditions you to be very glycolytic um, because we live in a Western society where we have access to sugary foods all the time. So our body's very, very well adapted to burning carbohydrates and turn that into glycogen. And, and it, it has learned to rely on the fact that we're going to stuff more glycogen in our mouth within an hour. Um, and what we're saying is like, hey, we need to sort of reverse engineer you to be a better fat adapted athlete, maybe better suited, maybe your ancestors were better suited in this regard, because they would go for days and days, quite slowly, most of the time, covering right. lots of ground, um, and having to rely on a fuel source that was much more plentiful in the body, um, and much more efficient, right? Fat is a much more efficient source uh, or, or a more efficient pathway to um, ADP than glycogen. And since our athletes are ultimately going to have to participate in activity that relies on the ability to go all day, let's match that up with a fuel source and an energy system that's biased towards going all day. Um, okay. So yeah, for us, it's like, try to go long. And even if long, long for some athletes, you know, can be seven, eight hours. But, you know, I've got a guy who I train who's in the Bay Area. He's a friend of mine. He's a dad. He's got um, four kids, four boys. Um, he's got two jobs. He's a crazy busy guy, you know, and he's like, man, I'm on the call with the, all these young guys who've got nothing but time. How can I train? And it's like, well, you got 60 minutes. Let's go for 60 minutes. But what's going to help is if you don't eat before you go, because if you're going on an empty stomach and your glycogen stores are a little bit worn down, then and you're going slowly while you're out there, then you're creating a better environment 
for your body to be like, hey, I need to find an appropriate fuel because I don't just have glycogen pumping through my veins and stashed in all of my muscle fibers, but I do have fat. Um, so we do with what we have and not everybody's got all day to go roam around the mountains. Right. But if we create the right training environment, then we can hopefully stimulate the right changes. Yeah. Okay, cool. That makes me miss uh, being in college. You know, that's what I did in college. My wife and I would go hike all day long, every weekend, multiple times a day. Now I see people do that. I'm like, I'm just living through you. <laughs> those, those, those are the days. Totally, for sure. man. Yeah. I mean, life gets busy. So the other thing I want to, yeah, I'm quite curious about. So let me ask you one more question. So the long, slow, steady state is the primary mode of your aerobic capacity suggestions. What about like when there's strength training? Like how much emphasis do you put on breath and breathing when people are doing lifting movements or hangboarding? Like I'm a big fan of having people think about tension through the abdominal wall and the use of the diaphragm with strength training. Is that something that you prioritize with your athletes? It isn't, but I'd love, I mean, I, I'm always a fan of your work and, and I love the way you think. So I'd love to hear more about that. The way that I sort of think about that, and I'm not saying I'm inflexible, but the way that I generally think is that, you know, I see a lot nowadays in training where there's um, coaches are very keen to cue athletes to do certain things. Um, hey, um, do this move like tighten your tighten your glutes or like tighten your abs or like engage your lats that doesn't make it I, I tend to think like my job is to create the right movement environment for you and then let your brain do the patterning and, and let your brain figure out like where let me feel where do i need tension hey where do i not need tension um you know do i need to breathe or do i not need to breathe so for example like let's say we're moonboarding, right? Or, or like on, on, your, uh, on your spray on wall where like everything is nails hard. Like the body is gonna rely so heavily on a phosphagen system and also obviously partially on a glycolytic system. And those are largely anaerobic pathways. So I think to me, it sort of makes sense that like when I'm bearing down for this big hawk or like squeezing my brains out on this small crimp and, and, and you know, moving up the wall, that if I'm not breathing, maybe that's because my brain knows that this move can be, is very, very difficult and that the, the ideal pathway for it does not rely on, 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 a, on, a, on the system. Now, now, obviously that works for one or two moves and then all of a sudden, you know, you're either panting or gassing out. So right. my, my general philosophy is this idea that I want to create the right environment for the brain to figure out what to do. That's what I try to do. I'm, but, you know, I, I'm interested in what you're saying and, and, and the work that you're doing around encouraging breathing. But I always remember how when I would climb, like if I'm climbing really, really hard, I'm trying something really, really hard for me, like my, my body does tend to shut my breath down. And part of that is probably okay because it's like, right. no, if I'm going to squeeze as hard as I can, um, that pathway isn't really an oxidative pathway. So it's okay. But at the same time, when you look at elite athletes, you know, the moments that they're doing that are so much shorter, right? Like maybe they're grimacing and bearing down for a quick second, but as soon as they can detension, they are detensioning. And maybe some of your work around cueing that can help to cue an athlete to be like, sure, you hold your breath for a quick sec, but get back to breathing quicker and, and use breath as a way to stimulate relaxation and detension so you can be efficient on the wall. Right. You yeah, know, I, I totally agree. And I like, I'm not really a fan of cueing people when they're climbing, certainly, because, you know, the, the only way we're going to get a, a lasting change in the behavior is really by changing the external environment. And I love the idea of like, we do it on our own. Like we learn the best by doing it on our own, by changing some factors about it. Really what I had in mind that I've been playing with is messing with this O2 saturation monitor and doing repeaters. And then during a repeater rest, like trying to breathe heavily 
and trying to like get CO2 out mm -hmm. of the system mm -hmm. to reperfuse the tissue prior to another effort. Or if I have people do that, like on doing bar isometric stuff, try to reperfuse by release, like, you know, decline in long term, like utilization of that system where we're going to have energy loss or, or muscle force loss is really kind of what I was thinking. Of. And then in, a, in addition to like, I think doing any sort of push up movement or those types of things, I think just simply thinking about tension through the belly and breathing is enough like core training for almost every climber in the world, right? Instead of having to focus on so much extra stuff on top of it, you know. Um, so the other thing I want to I want to talk about, yeah, I do want I you to give. I, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, I just remember you posting about that. Um, you know, and that makes so much sense to me that like my bias is very much towards like how do we integrate the body? How do we integrate movement and see strength not just as the application of force, but the patterning of that force? And when we start getting too isolationist, like do these crunches, do them over and over and over again and like tax your abs, it's like that doesn't make a lot of sense to me. I, I want to use my abs as a link in this long kinetic chain that contributes to movement. And I think that the idea of patterning movement is as important as the idea of how much force you can produce in that movement. Like I want to I wanna do both of those things sort of right. equally. Right, right. Yeah, no, I agree with that. I, I like that idea a lot. Um, something that I was thinking of, oh, man, what was it? Um, my brain just went blank. Um, you said, I want to uh, give you a, and then I cut you off. Uh, well, I do want to give you something. I do want to give you some of these those sweet-ass nature climbing granite holds. I'm going to send you a couple. So I do want to send you some of those. Okay. Like uh, Mads from, it's a it's a company from Denmark that, is just so cool and they're making and i suggested that they make these in cut crimps but they're rock so i will i will want to i do want to give you some of those i'm glad you said that but i can't remember i lost my train of thought but i do want you to <laughs> like for people that are watching i want you to give people that maybe when i do these ig lives i try and have other coaches give people suggestions on what to do like what are the th well give me like three primary movements you think that people should be training, just like climbers that want to do lots of stuff. Maybe they're big wall climbers. Maybe they're route climbers. What are three movements that maybe you could train, maybe body weight style or, or whatever, that you think are like the most helpful for the individual? Two. Okay. All right. Um, well, again, my bias is going to be towards longer lines of tension and trying to integrate um, the, the body into singular efforts. So, you know, a move that we like a lot is what we call the mega plank. And the mega plank is basically just like a very outstretched plank movement. I think of like, you're going to start in a baseline plank. Um, if you can go on, point, create enough tension in your feet, that you're pointing your toes straight down into the ground not letting them collapse like we would and then pressing into your forefoot, right? So like we're really big into training the feet and training tension in the feet. And you can do that in really simple ways in like your regular exercises by, by working on point like a ballerina would. But we're not going to do it standing up with our feet in that orientation. We're going to do it with our toes pointing straight into the ground, you know, in a in natural sort of um, dorsiflexion. So on point, and then we really like working on our fists. That's like a Samsara thing. I mean, it's not like the only way to do it by any means, but when you're on your fists, you're creating more of a stability demand for the stabilizers of the wrist. And when we put our hands flat on the ground, then obviously there's very little for the stabilizing um, matrix of connected tissue and, and muscles to play that stabilizing role. So we do like working on fists. So you're on your fists, you're on the points of your fingers, I mean, points of your toes. And now from this position, you're just gonna start, you know, so um, I, can, I can even show it here. Yeah, yeah, I'll show it live. Okay, so, you know, I'm gonna be, let's see, I'm gonna have to back up a bit. I'm gonna be here, all right? I'm gonna push into my, points of my toes. And now I'm just going to start 
slowly walking my hands out. Dude, if you can go all the way nose to the ground, you're boss. Exactly. If you can go nose to the ground, you're boss. But that's something what I like about that exercise is like we can program that for lots and lots of different levels of athletes because everybody can find an appropriate level of tension for them. And then what we actually say is like, don't even walk back. Just go to where you get to maximum tension and then just release yourself into the ground, right? It's sort of the same thing that we see with people doing like a one-arm lock-off. And then when they're done with the one-arm lock-off, then they do an eccentric. I'm like, no, 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 don't do that. Like, if you've asked right. everything of your body step in the lock-off, then step onto a stool and release it. Yeah, yeah, cool. I have a question. So when you're doing that, do you time, if people are walking out, do they spend a second of time walking out or what's the tempo that you suggest? Like, because assuming like you're going to get more and more recruitment very slowly as you get further away. So is that a time thing? Yeah, we do it as a time thing. So it's like get into your base, base plank and then walk yourself out as slow. Hold that for six seconds. Okay. Okay. And then release into the Okay. And then they would do yeah. five and sets of that, <laughs> 10 sets of that? Yeah, it depends. We're, you know, we're probably more commonly programming like three sets, three or four sets. Okay. Um, because, you know, it just, it, it seems like you're getting the most bang for your buck from a mechanical tension point of view on your first couple of goes. Yeah, you can continue to benefit for the fourth and seventh and tenth set, but you know the the rate of return has gone down. So we would say, hey, go ahead and do that more frequently, and um and and keep your your session shorter, right? Like a lot of times we're working with athletes, like even for myself, you know, I'll be out in the backcountry. I might be having like a six or eight hour day of endurance motoring around. And I take every single day that I do endurance work off of strength work, I'd never get strength work done. So for me, lowering the bar and making like a 20 minute session really count is so valuable because even when I'm tired, I can often get myself to do a 20 minute hard, hard session and then just be done and right. um, you okay. know, do it again in a few days. Okay, what did you, what did you call that again? We call it a mega plank. Mega plank. Okay, so that's mega plank number one. Show me what's another one. What's yep. number two? Okay, number two um, that I like that I think a lot of people would get down with. I'm actually really weak at this, so I should demonstrate it for uh, humbling myself. But is um, uh, a let. Oh, my, my phone's gonna allow this. There we go. Is um, we call it a front lever rep. So. It's isotonic, and you're just going to pull into a front lever and then release it. And then you're holding for maybe one second or just enough. To what you would suggest, just, just control it and then come back. Yeah, and, and the way that we're doing it is we're saying, don't come back to neutral, don't release the tension, ah. stay within a range of tension, but you're just gonna slightly lengthen and slightly shorten the tissues. So you're getting that range, but you're staying tension the whole time. And cool. you know, usually I'm doing like two reps because two re okay. that's at a maximum effort, that's all I can hang on to. So it's, okay. you know, it, it's maybe a little bit more encouraging than telling people to try to do a half lever or something because they just feel like, oh my gosh, I can't even get there. And I just say, just pulse through a couple of times, um, but, but staying in that zone of tension. Okay, I would say one thing to point out for all the followers is notice how he did not bend his knee because that's total bullshit and that does not help you at all. Like I'm amazed at how many people try to learn to do a lever by doing this knee bent position. It just doesn't make any sense from like an impulse generating perspective like eventually you're going to get enough tension to really go out if you need to but you have to develop 
the strategy and be able to generate force before you're ever going to be able to do that. Flexing your knee is a terrible strategy, in my opinion. You know, I totally agree. My line of thinking on that is that it's just you're shortening the line of tension. In fact, I tell my athletes, like, you should feel tension in the, in the tops of your feet. Uh, That's how yeah. long the line of tension should be. So if you're interrupting that by curling your feet in, then the line of tension is stopped at your hips. You know, right, you might as well right. lay on the ground and just do some ab crunches or something. Like, right, I, right. I agree. Like, keep that line of tension long. Connect more parts of the body into a singular effort just like climbing, just like right, right. whatever, moving, you know, um, make, make that line of tension involve, you know, the hip flexors, the quads, like send that line of tension down your, to your feet. Right. Yeah, no, that's yeah. sweet. One thing I've been, been wanting to play with one of these days is just put a bench out in front of me and hit your toes with a bench and then just push into the bench for five seconds. Do an isometric out of you know, some sort of range of motion to really help even force more tension. Because I get a lot of questions from people about the best way to train abdominal strength. And for me, it's definitely something with a lever type position, but being able to generate more force makes the most sense. So that's yeah, number two. What's number three? Away from it being... Oh, oh sorry. Three. Okay, uh, number three. So I'm going to go with one of my favorite lower extremity moves a, a, a single i call there's probably loads of names for it i call it a single leg body weight squat so to me when we think about strength and stability those are sort of like two ends of a spectrum on one end of the spectrum you've got things that are like really simple and and create an environment where your body can recruit all the muscle fibers and create tons of tension and then on the other end you have really unstable movements where, that are going to really limit the level of recruitment to me, this movement falls like roughly in the middle. I don't have a particular place where every movement should be this much stability and this much strength, but I do think that we should move a little back and forth across that, that range. Um, here's a, uh, a single leg body weight squat that to me, yeah, so I'm gonna be here and now I'm gonna go back and try to touch this knee down And after a few reps, and with a good warm up, you know, you can usually get to where you can go straight to the knee without the back leg touching at all. Um, and, and the thing with like any type of single leg squat is that the moment arm concept is so important because your butt is carrying and your hip is carrying all of this weight. And so the longer, the further it is horizontally away from the joint that's carrying the load, the knee, the more. And so it's a great movement because again, you can take a lot of different levels of athlete and program the same movement. So somebody who's crazy strong can just drop right down, touch their knee, maybe even hover above the ground for a moment at that place where the tension is gonna be crazy high. And something I really, really really prioritize is like don't come back up to standing that's such a waste of yeah yeah just it's such keep a waste the of time. as soon as you come back into a range there's no tension yeah exactly right. so it's like stay pulse through that range of tension don't come back up people have this idea that like if the range is bigger than the muscle is get doing more work and it's like no what what matters is how much tension you're putting the muscle under so stay in a range that's useful and then all of a sudden your session is like 20 minutes long instead of an hour long right 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 that's cool i think that's a good tip for people at home the thing that i like about that versus what people think about like we do pistol squats as the only method for doing it i like personally the position of the spine with that variation than with a pistol squat you know because it allows someone to keep their spine with more neutral flexion in the low back, but then they're going to be able to drive through their glute more and it's not so stressful on the knee. Like one thing that I'm usually questionable about with the pistol squat is it's super compressive on the meniscus and it like people doing a lot of that anyways is kind of risky for the knee where that movement looks even a little bit like less uh, mechanically loaded to the knee. Yeah, I mean, the pistol squat is like one of those cool things where like, if you can do it, it's cool. It, it's like surprising. Um, 
But really the part of the pistol squad that's the most valuable is not the bottom. It's when you, the moment arm length is the longest, which is like right in the middle, right? Yeah, yeah, when your, right. your hips are horizontal to it. So like another thing I have athletes do a lot of is like hang out in that 90 degree pistol squat bend um, isometrically. Cool. You know, have a stool or something, go down into it, hold it, and then put your other foot down to push back up. Don't then at the end of it, when you're exhausted, then do this hard concentric push. Um, and, right. and actually, Tyler, to, to, to give you credit here, um, you know, I love that density protocol. And I use that all over the body. I use that in, in single leg squats. I use that, I mean, just in so many different places because once you understand the thinking that, that drove you to kind of introduce that as an idea, then you're like, oh, wait a minute, I can use that you know, for elbows, for shoulders, for knees, for hips, for, 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 for feet and ankles. I use it a ton for feet and ankles. Um, we call it a symmetric. Grab a big old kettlebell, roll up onto your forefoot and, and go to exhaustion, go to failure. So, so that's something um, I do want you yeah, to talk about. Thing. I do want you to talk about, not about me, but I want you to talk about the feet too, because I know you're way psyched about the feet and the importance of that. Because someone asked, and I thought about you uh, yesterday when I forgot my climbing shoes and I was climbing with no shoes. I was like, I'll bet Z would be psyched about me climbing with no shoes. So tell me like kind of in a brief like five minutes, and then I want you to let people know how they can get a hold of you. But in that five minutes, like tell me about this, uh, the feet stuff that you're so psyched about right now. Yeah, um, this is maybe this some drill. Maybe some drill. Maybe some. That? Maybe some drill. Maybe some drills like you just described. Maybe something for the feet that people can train. That's maybe better. Okay. Well, I will tell you what. I'll I'll reference a, a a piece of research that really like helped things click for me. They were doing studies on human locomotion and trying to determine, especially in running, where does the um the rebound in our running stride come from. And so there was a few different little data points that came from a few different pieces of research, which I thought like really helped things click in my mind. So one of them is that they found that the metabolic cost of a red kangaroo running slowly was roughly the same as the metabolic cost of a red kangaroo running fast, which makes no sense, right? Like how can you run, how can you move fast at the same rate you can move slow? That doesn't make any sense. And what they found is that so much of the rebound in a kangaroo stride, it does actually not come from the muscle, but it comes from the elongation and the shortening of the Achilles tendon and of the entire fascial matrix that's connected to it. So that then was like, okay, well, that's very interesting about kangaroos, but, you know, so what kind of thing. And, you know, the, the architecture of the kangaroo's foot or, or lower leg um, is specifically designed and adapted to the environment that allows the kangaroo to bounce that way. And when you study that architecture and you try to see what other members of the animal kingdom have such architecture that promotes this rebound, they found that gazelles have very similar architecture and humans do as well. And the, the cue in human, the Achilles tendon is so thick. It's such a massive tendon and it's so well positioned to transfer load from the forefoot upstream into the body, right? So if we land on our heels, if we're thudding around on our heels, we're neutralizing the Achilles tendon because it's no longer under that tension that it would be under if we're on our four feet. Then another piece of research came my way um, where they studied the muscle length of the soleus under uh, running stride in live humans. And what they found shockingly is that the muscle length in the soleus does not change in a running stride. But what does lengthen and shorten is actually, you guessed tendon. it, the Achilles tendon. So what mm. all of that tells us, and I think is so fascinating, is that muscle does not power the rebound of the human stride as we thought, but it's actually the connective tissue that does. Right. So if that's the case, then should I really want to train the connective tissue to enhance that rebound capacity that's built into it? And no other part of our anatomy has been so shaped by our modern life as our feet have been shaped by shoes, right? Like 
you could say, well, you know, we're less adapted to the cold because we wear clothes, sure. But like, we have not transformed the way we move by anything more than shoes, right? And shoes nowadays are so cushioned and they're so ramped. And what that means is that we are naturally inclined to stride on our heels more because that's where the cushioning is. And as a result, we're really reducing the natural healthy stress that we would have on our Achilles. And our Achilles is getting very weak and so on and so forth. So what we wanna do is, it, and when you look at that, you realize like, wait a minute, that's a big deal. Because when we start altering our posture and the, the pattern of our human locomotion by strutting on our heels, the line of tension that results from our walking is now really different than it would have been if we had been barefoot. And I think that's a problem. I think that's really reshaping us in ways that are causing us a lot of pain and dysfunction. Right. Um, and so, you know, when, and, and I have athletes do this, right? Like walk around barefoot, thudding around on your heels, and you'll find how much tension that puts on your quads, right? Because you're, you're kind of in this leaning back position. Whereas if you go forward and you're on your forefeet, you find that line of tension is more posterior, it's more in the glutes. So we want to like, again, like sort of rewire that movement and ways that we're going to do that are to enhance the elastic rebound of our fascial system, of the connective tissue, starting with the Achilles and going upstream. So we spend a lot of time um, in what we call our ground force position. So ground force is where your toes are curled in, you're creating tension across all the plantar muscles of your foot, which is transferring that load into your Achilles. And then a lot of bounding, a lot of bouncing, huh. single leg bouncing, double leg bouncing. Um, and then we're going to go into lateral bouncing, fore aft bouncing. We do a lot of bouncing. Cool. Yeah, that's, that's cool. There's actually good evidence to support that brisk movement also reduces people with back pain as well. Another cool like piece of info is like part of the reason that you can train your, you know, your muscle can get more stiff than your tendon if it's trained for high rate of force development with plyometrics, all of that free energy goes to your tendon. So we're running out of time. We have two minutes. So how can people find out more about you, your program, or if they want to work with you? I mean, through your Instagram page, through your website, tell us how we can get a hold of your ideas and your, your body weight program. Sure, right on. Um, yep, through Instagram, we're, we're trying to be pretty active here. Uh, my guy Hayden is really involved in, in helping us curate good content, hopefully. And I think he's doing a great job. So shout out to Hayden. Um, and yep, Instagram. And then through our website, samsaraexperience.com. Um, okay. We've tried to really make our thinking accessible there. Um, and on in about a week, we're launching a new program. That's our first of its kind. It's called Basecamp. And Basecamp is going to be a uh, portal to the entire Samsara method. Um, it's a monthly subscription. So you show up, it, there's three buckets. There's assessment, there's um, plans, and then there's the library. And so it's a fully self-guided journey through our entire method. You show up, you take our strength assessment, you take our um, aerobic capacity assessment, you take our lactate threshold assessment, and that gives you some scores. We use those scores. You use those scores to help you select what level you're at. And then you choose from a plan that's either more aerobic or more strength oriented. But every plan is going to have both because that's what we believe in. Um, but you can choose. Yeah, like, I'm really awesome. more focused on that. And that's called Basecamp. And yeah, look out for that. One and week, then, sweet, sweet timing for sure. Yeah, super sweet timing. Yeah, thank you for asking and offering that opportunity for us to talk about that. Uh, every three months is when we um, open up spots on the athlete team. And those are limited spots. We're only taking 50 athletes. Um, so yeah, the next cycle starts in April and we do four a year. Okay, sweet. All right, well, you, got, you guys heard it. If you want to get a hold of Z, that's how you do it. And then... Um, Look in the wait in the mail, and I got some package coming for you, and then I'll talk to you on the other side. We're going to get kicked off any second. So I love you, man. Take care. Thanks so much, bud. Awesome to hang with you. Thanks, everybody. Cheers.